Hi, Tom. Welcome to the Professor Spotlight. It's so lovely to have you here today to talk a little bit about our visual arts program at Algoma University. My name is Taylor Nicey. I'm an enrollment specialist at the Brampton campus. And now I just want to pass it over to you and ask if you could introduce yourself and give us a little insight into who you are and what led you to the position that you're in today. Well, I'm, I'm Tom O'Flanagan. I, um, I teach visual art here. I'm an associate professor. I've been at Algoma University for 15 years, and I did a bit of thinking about this, and it's the longest I've been anywhere in my life, aside from my early days on the family farm in Saskatchewan, which I left when I was 17. So this is getting to be next to the longest place I've ever spent any time in my entire life. And I'm here because I was offered, uh, I was offered a position to start a Bachelor of Fine Arts program and to take up a professorship uh, 15 years ago. And when I was interviewed at that time, uh, the entire humanities division was the hiring committee. And if you think that's not intimidating, it's intimidating. But at the end of the interview, I loved the people so much, and apparently they loved me so much that we felt that we had to work together. And so that, um, that expectation I had about, uh, about the quality of the people uh, has not been betrayed in the 15 years I've been here. I really love the place, love the landscape, love the university, love the students, and I love my faculty members. So it's been, it's been all to the good for the 15 years that I've been here. So that's how I got here, and that's why I'm staying here. I, I don't ever plan to leave Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> it really is such a great place to live, and um, it's Amazing, you've been with the with the university for 15 years and you love it still just as much as you loved it the first day or in your interview, I guess. I want to ask if you have a favorite class. Pretty much. Yeah. Not really, but you know what? I really like the first year classes. Okay. I really, really like the first year classes. And, and I know that that's a bit of an anomaly because some like I taught at the University of Alberta for five years. Well, on and off. I taught for, collectively, I taught at the University of Alberta for about seven years. And among some faculty members, there was sort of a sense that the first year courses weren't that significant, that, that, that later on was when the real art instruction started and the real learning started to happen. But I really like the first year. I like the first year courses because, because number one, what you're doing is you're laying, you're laying a, a bedrock of experience for the, for the students. You're, you're not only talking about art, but you're talking about how to navigate through. You're talking about what we try to do here in the first years is, is build a sense of community, you know, to build a sense of, of everyone is in the same position. They're helping each other out. They're learning from each other. And I, I have found that most in, in most studio art courses, the, the learning among the students is as significant as anything the professor is going to put out there, maybe more significant. So I love the first year classes because they are, um, you know, the idea is that people are just starting out. They're kind of shy. Maybe they're a little tentative about things. They're sort of looking over their shoulder, thinking that everybody else is going to be better than them. And then they find out that everybody is pretty much the same as them. And uh, we really rely on that. We really rely on that idea that people are going to really come to appreciate each other's company and learn from and with each other. So. The first, and I'm not dismissing the upper year cor courses at all, but, but the first year courses for me are the ones that I really like teaching more than anything else. Yeah, and, and as a professor at Algoma where the class sizes are nice and small, you must really get to know your students as well. And, and those first year classes, you're meeting these new students coming in and a new talent as well. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, I could go on and on about this, but like this year, for example, we've been teaching remotely, which for me has been the biggest challenge of my life as a pro. I've been teaching for about 40 years now, and this has been the biggest challenge, you know, coming to terms with teaching studio art remotely, yeah. because so much of it is physical and so much of it is face to face. And it's, it's based on people looking at each other's work and talking on the spot. And it's been a real challenge, but this year, I'll give you one example of what happened this year. There, there was a student who was in our program and refused to come out from behind the black screen, like refused to come out because of shyness, right? 
And then I got some messages. I sent, sent a message to that student saying, what's, what's going on? And the student revealed that there were sort of emotional problems and some, you know, this and this and this. And so I just kept, I kept sending emails back and texting back and encouraging that student to come out from behind the screen. And about, about a month into the class, that student emerged from behind the screen. And, and the whole class sort of went, oh, there was this intake of breath and people said, hello, and how oh, it's so good to see you and so great. And I considered, I consider stuff like that to be a major achievement in, in the class dynamics. You know, the idea that somebody comes out of themselves and, and has the courage, like in this remote situation, especially has the courage to just present themselves and to be there and to, and to share. So uh, I mean, for me, it's really important that students learn about about visual art as a discipline and as a practice and as a history. Yeah. But but so much of what this is about, professionally, what it's about, and humanly, what it's about, is what we say that within this program, so much of it is about the students finding their own voice, like finding mm -hmm. a way to articulate their sensibility and their personality. And it's also about telling their own stories. Like there's a lot of concentration on family and how. Um, how your own lived history affects your work. And that's becoming more and more of a powerful aspect of this program. So I'm, I'm going completely off track, I think, with this response. But, but the, idea, the idea really is that um, those, those dynamics are awfully important. And I'm not giving you any chance to ask any questions here. So I should just <laughs> slow down. No, no, what you have to say is so important. I, I agree. Um, I've talked to a lot of professors and a lot of them have expressed the difficulty with teaching online and I only can imagine with a program such as visual arts where there is um, like a lot more of those aspects to the coursework that needs to be in person but it's it's great to hear that you've been breaking through some barriers and still having successful classes and great class dynamic. We got to a point with remote and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, you know I'm not touting anything in terms of a great uh, pedagogical victory or anything, but we got to a point with the first year courses where we were having a lot of fun. Like there was, okay. we started the classes with what we called idle chit chat. It just got to be something that organically grew up in the classes, but, and it started, it started with things like people's cats and dogs being on screen because they're all at home, right? So a, a, a cat would walk past or start cuddling up against somebody. You'd say, what's with that cat? What, what's that cat's name? There's, we'd have a conversation about cats, cats versus dogs, or maybe the next time we'd say, those Star Wars movies, the prequels, you know, the, the originals, they were fantastic, but those middle ones, you know, the middle ones, did they, did, did they suck or not? Yeah, oh, they suck. And so, so we'd spend about 15 minutes before every class started having those kind of conversations. We called it idle chit chat, <laughs> idle chit chat. And the students got to a point, I got to a point where everybody was looking forward to the classes. Everybody was looking forward to, they, they talked about how much fun they were. And, and within that, they actually started, I thought it was impossible at the start, but it got to a point where people were actually getting it done, right? And making mm -hmm. progress. And at the same time, having a good time with it. So, um, I mean, one of the reasons I'm still teaching at the age I'm at is that I really love teaching. My, my, uh, my grandfather was a one-room country school teacher in Saskatchewan, and his parents, my great-grandparents in Ireland, were hedgerow school teachers. I don't know if you know what that means, but when, when the when the English um, forbade the the uh, practice of the Irish language and Irish education and Irish religion, you know, during what were called the penal laws. My great-grandparents were illegal underground backyards in the church basement teachers in, in Ireland. And three of my aunts were, I, I considered teaching to be my family inheritance. It's like the family legacy. Yeah, passed so, down. <laughs> pardon? Yeah, passed down by many generations. Your family. Yeah, and, and back and back to the, to the time when Ireland was under colonial rule. So I feel a certain, a certain um, and I've, I've talked about this with a lot of our indigenous students about, about the idea of colonialism and about the idea of, mm -hmm. of how, um, well, I don't start me talking about this, but the idea <laughs> of colonial oppression, it comes out of my family legacy as well. So it's all part of the mix, right? Yeah, oh, good stuff, good stuff. 
Um, moving to talk a little bit about visual arts and careers that come from it. I'm wondering if you could yeah. share some examples of where you see some of your past students going after they pursue this program or just examples in general of what you can do with a degree that is focused in visual arts. Well, um, there, there are a lot of common misunderstandings about, about the worth and value of a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in either music or theater or especially studio art. There's, there's still, a, I just heard a piece on CBC this morning about, about say for example, some of the cancellations that are happening at some universities. And there is still an idea that the arts are a kind of, um, a kind of secondary thing or that they're a kind of hobby thing or they're a kind of um, a, a superficial adornment to human life that's not really necessary. It's, it's something that we do when we have the time or we have the money or we have the whatever. Um, and the one thing I can say is that is that when I started this business over 40 years ago, the opportunities were quite limited. There weren't a lot of art graduates and there wasn't a lot of um, subculture or superstructure attached to art and culture in Canada, in any of the arts, right? It was really a hard scrabble kind of thing. But in the past 40 years, there's been more and more and more. I mean, you, you sort of understand people's consumption of film and movies and, mm -hmm. and theater and, and culture. And just from the point of view of consuming culture, it's, it's radically expanded. Also from the point of view of employment and the idea of what is it you're going to do with your, it's not even what you're going to do with the degree, but it's what you're going to do with the experience that the degree grants you. It bestows upon you a particular kind of, a particular kind of mind, let's say, and, and one, of the, one of the particular aspects of that particular mind is, is, that, is, that, is that visual art thinking is, is it's, about, it's about finding your way through a particular situation without necessarily knowing what the outcome is, right? You start a painting, there could be 10,000 ends to that painting. There could be 100,000 ends to it. So you do something and then you do something and then you do something and then you mess up and then you do something else and then you do something else. And so, so I say that it, it's a lot of it is based on ambiguity, you know, not really knowing what you're doing, but having faith in your, in your skills and your history. And then, and then putting those in the service of this, this process that you're involved in that is really, really pretty un, unknown and pretty uncertain. So that's a kind of adaptive intelligence, right? That's an intelligence that's based on, on, on improvisation and making things up, not making things up in terms of, of fantasy or anything, but making things up relative to circumstance. And that kind of thinking, if you, if you listen to a, a lot of contemporary thought, um, and if you think about the kind of skills that more and more corporations are looking for, or more and more organizations are looking for, like as far back as 15 years ago, I, I was teaching in Fort McMurray, which is at the time was the, was the area of the, of, of, of the oil sands, right? It still is, but at the time it was in immensely powerful. And at that time, the um, public relations person for Syncru, which was the biggest of, of, the, of the, the petrochemical companies, said that what they were looking for in their corporate mind was the kind of adaptive intelligence that was coming out of the arts. They said they didn't care about MBAs anymore. They didn't care about that kind of stuff because there were a billion of them out there. But what they were looking for was adaptive thinking that was the, the, the that was especially appropriate coming out of, of out of art studies. And he, then he cited visual art as the as the kind of dominant one. So I think that I think that people out there who are thinking about, you know, oftentimes there's this common idea that you, um, uh, if you're putting your child in university and and enrolling them in an art program. They, they might do the art program and then they're going to get serious about what they're going to do or there's still a struggle sometimes with with the idea of it's not going to get them anywhere but we have a rolling list and i could rattle off i mean there's not enough time i could rattle off um i could rattle off instant after instant after instance of students who've done really well in terms of careers but also, and I think this is really important, they've done really well in their lives. Yeah. This is the thing I find so confirming is that if, if we look at the lived history of our grads, they have lived after graduation, 
they've lived remarkably good, rich, full, complete lives. You know, sometimes some of them have married and had children. Some of them have gone on to graduate degrees. Some of them, have, but the thing that's very confirming about what's happened to so many of our students after they graduate is that the trajectory of their lives has been enormously rich and really rewarding. And I think that's something that everybody has to think about is like, what does an education do and what is an education for? I mean, certainly it's about getting a career, but it's also about how you enable your life, how you, how you, how your education will will allow you to live a life of nobility and decency and, and all of that. And because we stress so much the idea of community and interaction and trust yeah. and actual love for each other, I think that that's, that's one of the reasons uh, so many of our grads have done so well is that, is that they come out not, not assuming the world is a kind of hard scrabble competitive place, but they assume that the world is a place that is really, is really based on, 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 on comradeship and really based on trust and really based on cooperation you know all of those things so um you know there there are these standard lists of what careers you can select when you when you have a bachelor of fine arts degree um i tell this story about a friend of mine he's a a man named david van vliet i'll use his name because it's it's important we went to art school together and he graduated and he never made art and that's like going to the priesthood and not becoming a priest, right? Like, oh, poor Dave, you know, he never made art. He, he, got a, he got a degree and he never became a painter or a sculptor or whatever. But what Dave did, he got the environmental bug in, in the late 60s, early 70s, and he started Saskatchewan's first environmental uh, consumer product store, like non-phosphates, the stuff that's common now, but the stuff that wasn't common then. Yeah. And he... He sold these, these consumer, these environmentally appropriate consumer goods. 15 years, the business failed, his marriage fell apart. It was a tragedy. So what he did after all of that, he regrouped, he recalibrated, and he went to the University of Calgary and ended up getting a PhD in environmentally appropriate urban design. Hmm. And he's now one of the go-to guys in Canada. He teaches at the University of Manitoba. So he went from the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree to the environmental thing, and then the environmental thing and the adaptive intelligence and the design ethic created this, this situation for himself where he became, he became sort of what he had in his heart. You know, yeah. he became a guy who, he was involved in, in the first completely internalized environmentally appropriate house construction in Calgary, which then morphed into an entire neighborhood in, Cal in Calgary of all places, petrochemical mm -hmm. capital of the world. It, he, so this is the kind of story that happens all the time. And sometimes it takes, sometimes it takes a while for that kind of stuff to unfold. Like what, are, what, are, what is the fruit of your experience? Well, it took David, took my friend David 20 plus 25 years maybe for that to happen. But yeah, everything, there you go. it's so important to highlight that that what you're doing, especially considering where you're choosing to go to university and what program you're choosing to go into, it's a building block for, you don't even know where you're in, in the future, what's to come. And there's good stuff to come, but you don't have to have that plan um, right from, from first year, right from, right from day one. Well, I'll tell you about, can I tell you about my first year? Sure, yeah. I. I went, I went to the University of Saskatchewan. I was 17 years old and I was just off the farm. And I came from a very remote Northeastern part of Saskatchewan. And uh, I really liked pop. I really liked the Beatles and the Rolling Stone. I was, that was that era of the British invasion. I liked rock, that rock and roll stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in the whole hippie movement and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought I should go to art school. So I went to art school and I was such a terrible student that at the end of two years, I got my grade point average was 54%. And I kept getting letters from the dean's office saying, please withdraw from the university because you will not ever succeed. You will not succeed. And I did, I did, I said, well, they can't be serious about this. So I just kept going and um, didn't get any better. And so I, I booked off a couple of years and I married my beloved wife. My, we were, she was 18 and I was 20 and we got married and I, got a job at the university library and I went back to school and then I became a star in the department. I had to redeem myself. 
So I became like a workaholic, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, but my story is, my story is that, is that, is that I failed first year painting. I failed first year painting and I ended up with a 54% grade point average. And now I'm teaching art at a university. So <laughs> how, I, how ironic is that? Right. So the, the, the thing is, the thing is you just have to have the, the, the determination and I suppose the willpower to do it, like to just, and then, and then to find some allies, like my wife became my ally. Yeah. And my friends in art school became my allies. And then I found some professors. I found some professors who really got me. Like they really, they, re they said, you have talent. And, and it's, it's they, they sort of, they, they understood that I wasn't um, a kind of linear person, right? Yeah. So, so armed, with, armed with these relationships, you know, the relationship with my bride. And we were married for... My, we were married for 47 years. My, my wife passed away of cancer about, about five years ago, but, but she was like my life partner and my beloved. And then, and then we had this community of friends around ourselves. And we also, got a, we also got a way to believe, like we found a way to navigate through the world. And, um, and, but it took time, right? It took, it took quite a bit of time for me to get my act together. So, so I'm saying that when I see students come in the door first, first day of classes and I see students sort of like myself in first year who were kind of messed up and kind of mixed up and don't know what to do and they're kind of stumbling around I have enormous sympathy for those students like I have I have enormous sympathy it's like the student who came out from behind the screen this year yeah. in remote learning I saw myself you know like I saw myself in that student so um it's um Oh, I, could, I mean, if, if we were live and direct, I could tell you more stories about that. But these, these are the kind of things that I think are really important, at least for me, they're really important. Incredibly, it's the human experience, you know? Incredibly important. And, and the community that you're talking about that is that you see in these classes at Algoma and just in general on the campus of Algoma, it all contributes to each student's lives. They're not just a number and they're not just taking the coursework and submitting the assignments. It's so much more, their entire experience and it contributes to, to, to mm. it become. You, 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 can't, you can't say enough about that. Like I taught at the University of Victoria for a while and I taught a theory class that had 420 students in it. A lecture class, 420 students. Well, try to and we, we actually got this off the ground. We actually did this, but you try humanizing a class like that. We started doing live performances. We, I started walking in between the rows. I started, it was almost like doing stand-up comedy. But the thing is that a class that has 400 plus students in it, it's very easy for you as a student to go missing. It's very easy for you to just not have any contact with the instructor. And if you want to hide out, you can hide out and everything else. So. And I taught, you know, when I taught at the University of Alberta, there were how many students? 40,000 students, 40,000 students. And it's not, it's not as if those big places want to be impersonal, but built into that scale, there is this possibility of, 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 of impersonality and students have to work a whole lot harder. And I'm not just, and I'm not doing this comparison like because we're little, we're great. And because they're they're large, they're 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 monsters. I'm not saying that. I mean, there's great good to be found in the big places, but one of the sacrifices in the big places is is the potential you have to be to be sort of um, relatively insignificant in terms of the, the the big numbers, right? Yeah, and I think here too, here it's not the uh, case. I think too, when um, especially when when you're quite young, or these students that are you know. 18, 19 coming into university, it's easy to not hold yourself accountable. I mean, at any age it is, but it's easy to not hold yourself accountable and to let yourself fade into the background because it's easy to do so. And, and, but having those classes where, you know, you're pushed out of your comfort zone and you feel like you, you need to participate, you're going to thank yourself, thank your first year self for doing that and just like evolving into what you become throughout your years at university, really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could speak a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and, and as, as a... As a Go ahead. 
Sorry, I just missed that. Sorry. Oh, I was going to ask if we. Sorry, could... I just. I was going to ask if we. Could... You keep your chatting a little bit about why you enjoy instructing at Algoma specifically. I know we've been talking about about the small class size, and I think it's great. Um. Well, uh, can you hear me? Because you were you were sort of cutting in and out there briefly. Can yeah. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, there's 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 what to like about teaching in our particular department and teaching art, and I've sort of talked a bit about that already. So, so the question about why I like teaching at Algoma is um, it has to do with the idea that that my my colleagues are very near to me. Mm -hmm. You know that that like say for example, when I taught at the University of Alberta, our department was so big that there was like printmaking was a separate department and painting was a separate department. And, um, you know, so, so the, the, the department itself was big to the point where it was sort of, it was sort of uh, sectioned off from discipline to discipline. Um, so what I like about being here is that um, I have a lot of really close friends, professor friends who are in, completely different disciplines. You know, they're in psychology or they're in history or they're in this and this. And so I have, I have the great bounty of, um, I have the great bounty of being with people who are in a, a discipline that's completely different than mine. And we can share ideas or we can talk about things and we find, we find things that are common to each other and we find things that are not common to each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's not just, it's not just for me, it's not just the, the proximity you have to the students, you know, the idea, the intimacy of the relationships with the students, but it's the proximity that you have to people from different backgrounds and different disciplines that, that um, can really inform your life. You know, they can really, they can really provide you with um, a, a, a different insights into, into your own particular reality. And the other thing is, the other thing is what I like about teaching here there's still a really great sense of humor in this place. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a really kind of, like at least a lot of my friends, a lot of my faculty friends, there's, there's a really, um, I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but there's a really, um, there's a really great sense of comedy here. Like a really great sense of, uh, you know, that I'll tell you the story. I, I, I taught at Brandon university for a year and my wife and I went out to an antique store on the edge of town and, um, I was wearing a white t-shirt. I remember this. I was wearing a white t-shirt and a pair of Carhartt work pants and hiking boots and sunglasses. And I walked in and there was this old gal behind the desk and she had, she had these cat's eye glasses on and her antique shop specialized in mid-century glassware, you know, that kind of decorative yeah. glassware. And she, she looked us up and down and she said, where are you folks from? And I said, well, we're from here. She looked me up and down like, I don't quite believe you because we were fairly new in the city. And she says, what do you, what brought you here? And I said, oh, I got a job at the university. And she said, what job was that? And I said, um, I'm a professor. And she looked at me and she said, you don't look like a professor. <laughs> and I said, well, what does a professor look like? And she, yeah. she put her glasses down. She said, she said, they all wear those tweed coats with the elbow patches. And they all have beards. <laughs> and, and I think people still think that about professors. Like they think yeah. they've got an idea like that's, that's, that's 80 years out of date, right? Like, yeah, we're all pretty hip. Like we're all, you know, we all watch anime <laughs> movies and we all have, you know, we, we listen to popular music and, um, you know, people like Michael DeSanto are wickedly good blues bass players and <laughs> Sheila Gruber is an incredible roots fiddle player. And, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the things, one of the things I like about being a professor in the here and now is that we don't wear tweed jackets and elbow patches. <laughs> and if you do, you're forgiven for it. You're forgiven <laughs> for it. <you> know? <laughs> Tom, I so, heard that's all coming back. That's... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no well if it does if it does that's okay that'll be a kind of a tweedy sort of a Sherlock Holmesian kind of thing that that'd be okay by me too but if that comes back pipe smoking has to come back pipe smoking has to come back. 
we'll see. They go hand in hand. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They go hand in. Smoking a pipe and having a beard and wearing a tweed jacket, you know, that's that's a kind of professor. And and then the other thing that this woman suggested was that they were all men, that they mm. were all men, right? So yeah, so I have her noticed. idea. Of- I have no yeah, my um my professor spotlights getting to know more and more of the Algoma professors that you're right they they all have a good sense of humor and and are all pretty yeah. unique to themselves as well. There's no cookie cutter uh, professor out there no. at least. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I mean, it's it's as diverse a bunch of people as you're going to find anywhere on the planet, right? And, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's one of the diversity is the key to human life you know the idea of um you know cultural difference ethnic difference difference different variety 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 i uh, i um when i when i was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago uh i my one of my doctors was a, a, a an extraordinary russian woman who moonlights as a runway model in toronto and we had this conversation the first time she met with me we had this conversation because she was from she was from siberia right okay. and um, we started having this conversation about human diversity and we came to this understanding that was so great i came to this understanding that the more diverse the human planet is the better it's going to be diversity 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 and i think that's one of the things that we're aspiring to at algoma right we've got this we've got this mandate we've got this mission mm-hmm. um, but at the same time like in in the 15 years I've been here, the faculty is much more diverse than it was. You know, in terms of in terms of its its ethnic background, in terms of its gender balance, in terms of everything else. So, it's and it's a generational thing, right? It changes it changes over one generation to the next to the next. So um, there's um so that, I'm trying to answer your question about why I like teaching here. Like here, I mean, I just like I like teaching, but. Why do I like teaching here? It's because of, it's because of the nature of the program that we have here, and is also because of the variety that I see and and the spirit that I see in the faculty. And that's not saying that we don't have problems, that we don't have issues, and there's not tension and friction and everything else. That's a normal part of human life. Like it's not just, uh, it's not the entirely the peaceable kingdom here, but that's a good thing too because diversity of opinion is also part of human diversity right yeah yeah I definitely agree you you learn from learn the most sometimes from people that are so different than you it opens your eyes up to so many different uh, views and and opinions and and I think it's a great thing I totally agree do you have any advice for students that are considering this degree that you want to share I feel like you've shared a lot of great stuff already um like what, what kind of, like, what kind of, um, what would you think? Maybe like? for prospective students that are considering uh, the visual arts program at Algoma for ones that maybe are on the fence, um, just, yeah, general advice for those students that are making those tough decisions about what program that they want. Well, I, there's, there's likely a lot of things to say. But the thing that comes to my mind right now, right, right now is, mm-hmm. is that we, we have a really good program here. And I'm, I'm not, everybody's gonna say that to you. Everybody's gonna say, we have a wonderful program. And they likely all do. But, but the fact is we have a really wonderful program here. And we have, we, have a, we have a great faculty. We have a great history now, like after 15 years of this, of this program, we have, and, and it, it existed as an art program before that. So we have, we have a, a legacy here. We have a history here. We have a great faculty. We have had great students. And in the past, we have had better numbers than we do, better numbers. So what, what I'm gonna say about, about your, to, in response to your question is, is that we need more students in our program. Like we need more students. And I'm not, I'm not getting down on my knees and begging you to come, but I'm saying that, that if, if, if you're looking for a, an art program that has all of the right stuff in terms of more traditional stuff, more contemporary stuff, a very, very well qualified faculty. If you, if you look at our resumes, our, our, our vitae's, um, we, have, we have a great track record in, in terms of our professional practices, mm-hmm. um, exhibitions, grants, 
collections, all of that stuff. So we have, we have a great history. We have a great faculty. We have had great students. And we have, we have an animating spirit in the program that is really, really wonderful to witness. But we need more students to share that. We need more students to share that. And so, so what, I, what I would say to prospective students, and I have said to prospective students, if, if you want to come to a place that has all the right stuff, but a place where you will make a difference, like you will, you personally will make a difference to the success of that program, and that that then will inform your sensibility and your and your future. Then you should come to us because you will be important. You know, you will be an important member of the team, and that's how we that's how we see new students. Like we see new students as coming into. I was I was almost going to say the family. That that's a little too corny. But it's, it's like coming into it's like coming into the web of relationships that we have established here. Like I, I'm Facebook friends with 70 former students. Yeah, I can I can dial them up right away. I'm on the phone with former students all the time. You know, we've had former students. They, this is the other story. I'm talking too much. I know, but this is my yeah. way. <laughs> we had a student here. We had a student here several years ago, and I'll I'll use her name. It's important, Jesse Buchanan. Okay. So Jesse Buchanan uh, is of uh, Anishinaabe background, right? And um, she came here because she thought the small art program would be helpful, but she also wanted the Anishinaabe studies components. She came here and uh, she was a great student. Like she was a great student. And um, she graduated here. Um, she eventually, shortly after that, married. She and her husband started having several several children. Um, Jesse uh, took a degree in uh, in um, in um, in in art art healing practices, counseling practices, um, and she now is uh, she has a gig counseling Indigenous youth in the north of Ontario. That's her gig. She has a job. And she's continued painting and the painting career is starting to take off. But what I wanted to say about Jesse was that during the bicentennial year, was it the bicentennial year? The 150th anniversary of Canada. Mm -hmm. In that year, the Winnipeg Art Gallery had a project where they were going to select three artists for, for, their, for their project. And one artist would travel from the East to Winnipeg and one would yeah. travel from from the west to Winnipeg and one from the north to the south only three from the whole country only three only three for the whole country and Jessie was one of the three she was one of the three and the gig and the gig involved traveling with a shipping container that was a makeshift studio and they would land in small communities on the way to Winnipeg and they would do interactive um, art, education, and exhibitions, and they'd move on to the next one, the next one, and this all culminated at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. It was an incredibly high honor. That's what one a, story. What a one cool story. project. That's amazing. Yeah. What a cool project. And Jesse yeah. was the one chosen, one of the one, one of the three chosen. And um, so there's stories like that, right? Really, really important stories because they they have to do with community and they have to do with you know the idea that that. Part of, the, part of the idea was that she started in the Northwest Territories. Mm -hmm. I think she started with the Inuit people in the, North, in the Northwest Territories and came down and then over to Winnipeg. So I tell you stories like that all day. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. Yeah, I'm sure you have so many of them too, still being in touch with your former students, um, being able to see where they've been, where they've went. You've You've known them since their first year and, and being a professor yeah. 15 years at Algoma, there's students that have been graduated for, for 10 plus years and they yep. must be doing incredible things. And the ones that we're in touch with, and we're in touch with almost all of them, not, not everyone, of course, but m most of them, they're, they're like good pals now. Like they're yeah. really, it's, one, it's gone from being the student mentor thing to being your good friend thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, and that's really rewarding too. We kind of downplay the idea of the you know the the, the big shot professor here. Like we mm -hmm. we really downplay the idea of, uh, you know, we say 
we, our advantage is that we have had enough experience to know some things about the discipline. But the discipline is so vast over history and over cultures, it's so vast, we can't possibly know everything. We know a little teeny bit about it, right? So, so, so at, the, at the end of your experience, what, what's gonna happen is that you will know more about it than you do now. And then sooner or later, you're going to, I mean, hopefully, part of the role of being an instructor is you kind of hope that your students are going to end up being better than you, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, like they, you know, you kind of hope that A, they're going to be different than you, and B, they're going to sooner or later get to be better than you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the role, role of professors and also parents, I feel like, feel that way about that's children. Right. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. You, yeah. You, want, you aspire to have your kids. You don't you don't want your kids to be, um, you know, lesser than you. You want your kids to be more than you, right? I think that's. Yeah. I think that's sort of part of the. That's part of the. That's part of the idea of incremental human development. Is, and sure. then you hope that every generation, every generation is going to be better than the last one. Like, like I grew up in the '60s. I was a student radical in the '60s. I grew up in the '60s. You know, civil rights era, all that kind of stuff, and. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I was on the picket lines at universities demanding no tuition, you know, and, and all that. That didn't really work out over 45, 50 <laughs> years. But, uh, but you know what I mean? But you sort of expect, like in terms of, say, right now, what's going on so potently in the world, the idea of race and the idea of, the idea of, of, of human, human dignity and civil rights and everything, what you hope now is that is that the generation that's taken up the cause again is going to push through like they're going to yeah. they're going to take the torch that was established way back when and they're going to make it burn brighter that's what you hope and i think that's what's happening that's right mm -hmm. so so one of the one of the things i like about teaching at university is the idea that you can you can do a lot of cross generational stuff and and in our program and i think in this university too um like in any given first year class, there will be students who are fresh out of high school, but there will be students, like I had a couple of classes a few years ago where, where some of the students were 50 to 70 years old in first year, right? So, so you've got this cross-generational thing that begins to happen that is really something. So it's not just, I mean, for people who are interested in this program, it's not just a program of 18 and 19 year olds, but it's also a program of quote unquote mature students. And then it's really, it's really delightful to see how those interrelationships start happening. You know, how, how the 18 and 19 year olds relate to the 50 year olds and how they, they, they become part of the team together, right? And that's, that's another, I mean, that's another really great advantage to not just teaching here, but, but to the idea of education in and of itself. It's not, it's not limited to like, it's not limited to people just fresh out of high school. It's 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 very broad in its in its demographic. Yeah, and it's, it's so important to just think to never stop learning. You just you never know who you're going to learn from or what you're going to learn. It doesn't matter your age or or if you're even still in school or can, if you're considering pursuing school at a later time in life too. Like there's just all this opportunity to continue to learn. Like you said so yourself, being a professor and obviously students looking up to you knowing that you have more more knowledge on the topic than them but you said yourself that you're still learning too like every year everybody's growing there's always room to grow yeah yeah and and I don't um I personally don't like the idea of people looking up to me I personally don't like the idea I don't I don't like being called professor for example I I, I will not um, I will not tolerate being called sir or being called professor or any of that because, because as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, we're all sort of in it together, right? Mm -hmm. We're all sort of we're in it together. And some of us, as I said earlier, some of us might have a bit more experience or quite a bit more experience, mm -hmm. but that doesn't qualify you to be a better person. It doesn't qualify you to be better than somebody else. You know, it's one of those misconceptions about, about, about education is you know, some of my, some of the best people I've known in my lifetime have been people who've had great, I mean, my wife and I used to spend a lot of time on reserves in Saskatchewan in the 70s. And some of the elders that we met did not have any education 
And they were some of the wisest people I've ever met in my life. And so, you know, it's, it's all part of a continuum. It's all part of a, it's all part of, a, you know, wisdom is not necessarily based on getting a degree. It's based on kind of experience that you have over the course of your life. So, and then, and then if you have those kind of, if you have those kind of uh, values, you have to start living up to them, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Well, Tom, to end off this interview, I do love to ask each of my professors how they bring the thunder, aka what makes their program at Algoma U so special. I feel like you've given so many great points. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to end off? Uh, well, one of the one of the things I, I want to say is that, um, like, I've been listening to um, I've been listening to the. I listen to CBC radio all the time. It's sort of like my central media feed, right? I, I listen to CBC radio in the morning and I, I go to CBC website at night. And uh, I've, been, I've been tracking what's happened at Laurentian. And I don't want to get into the politics of Laurentian or talking about decision makers or anything like that. But um, one of the things that I think is really important about, about, like we don't have a theater program here, but we do have a music and an art program. And, um, and I think, I think that those programs are, they're sort of the heart. They, 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 and other people have said this too, that um, there, there, is, there is sort of the idea of the, the, the mind of the university and there's the soul of the university and the this and the that. But I think we're kind of like the poetic heart of the university. I think we are. And I think that that's sort of been borne out in evidence over the years. And um, we've had some really extraordinary people within this, with this program. And um, if I was thinking about bringing the thunder, part of bringing the thunder is, is that there's, there's sort of the idea of, the, of thunder being large and magnificent. There's also the idea of the thunder being kind of discreet and you know how the thunder rumbles. You know, okay, yeah. Rumbles kind of. <laughs> Kind of subtly, and I think we're kind of like that. I mean, I think that we're um, that we're we're subtle and and we're poetic. And um, I also think that I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but um, there was the you know the annual. Did you see the annual service awards? The I service did, yes. awards here. Did you see what our students did? Like when mine came up. Um, no, not specifically. I don't. Okay, know. so. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see when it came time for my presentation for me to be, you know, the service, I couldn't be there because I had to go and teach. <laughs> so, like I had to go and teach. So I, I couldn't be there because they had all these technical glitches at the start. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't, but I, I, I did see the, I did see the videos afterwards. And um, two of the students were sitting in one on one screen. And then my colleague Andrea was sitting on another screen. And then another student who was Russian was on another screen. And the first thing he did was he put on a rubber mallard duck head and he started going, yeah, yeah, like a, like a rush. <laughs> he could, he keep putting his, so somebody would say something kind of interesting about me and this duck head guy would be going, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, like that's sort of what we're about, right? Zany and kind of like, and a lot of the other presentations were really, like really serious, like, you know, like blah, 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 nothing wrong yeah. with that. But we had a duckhead guy and two other students who were giggling so much on the other camera that they could hardly contain themselves. So, <laughs> uh, you know, like I think you take I think you take that kind of stuff away from a university. You uh, you start quickly losing your um, your sense of humor and your sense of you know. I'm not, and I'm not dismissing other departments. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that there is, there is something about uh, about the art program and about the music program that infuses the place with a different kind of spirit. Oh yeah, and uh, that, and that's important, really important. Definitely, I definitely think that um, after talking to you, getting to know you a little bit, it sounds like your students know you quite well. They would have thought about that that duck head and been like, "Yeah, Tom will like that. Uh, he'll laugh at that." Oh yeah, yeah. I, I just I, when I saw it later that I saw the video that night, I just fell to the floor. I thought these are my people. These are my people. It's yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, and it was a big duck head. Like it was a big. Duck head. 
Yeah. And then, <laughs> That's so well, funny. where did he get that thing? Like, where did he get, and did he have it perfect, or did he just have it in the closet? He went to the closet behind him, opened the closet door, put on the duck head, and then he sat there for the whole of the time <laughs> on screen with his duck head. It was just brilliant. So funny. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely the visual arts program adds a lot of color to Algoma University. Color. Yeah. Color. Amazing. Physical and actual and poetic and, and everything yeah. else. So. <laughs> Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today on the Algoma University Professional yep. Spotlight. It was truly lovely talking to you and um, yep. hearing all your stories and a little bit more about the visual arts program.